So um, in this next chapter of Yasser, Yasper's uh, origin and goal of history, uh, we get a rather banal uh, accounting that's kind of old-fashioned and full of a lot of commonplaces. There's not much fresh thinking in it, and nowadays it reads like a very old-fashioned narrative. Um, so rather than discuss it, uh, it's just full of things that make man different from animals and that give him certain cultural characteristics that make him uniquely human. I'm going to skip all that and substitute it, uh, substitute for it my own knowledge, uh, which is based on uh, several years ago, seven years or so ago, I did quite a bit of research on all the latest scholarship in archaeology about the epoch of uh, the prehistoric period, Paleolithic and Neolithic. And I want to go through that now uh, as a kind of substitute for Jaspers's chapter here. Um, so what we basically have uh, is the period, if we go back, we've been in the, the Ice Age, the current Ice Age cycle that we're in now has been going on for two and a half million years. Uh, the planet had uh, cooled down to the point where the CO2 levels were at a manageable uh, level. Uh, we get the formation of the West Antarctic Ice Sheet about 35 million years ago, and then about 3 million years ago, the Arctic ice cap begins to form, which is now melting and disappearing. And about 2.5 million years ago, we get this current oscillation that we've been in between ice ages and interglacials ever since. Uh, what used to be called the diluvial period. Uh, uh, diluvial, of course, means flood. And uh, 200,000 years ago, we have the Salian Ice Age, uh, which is one of the last of them. Uh, the Salian Ice Age lasted from 200,000 years ago to 130,000 years ago. Then we get the so-called Eemian, what used to be called the Reese verm interglacial period, is now called the Eemian, which comes into being uh, between 130,000 and 114,000 years ago. And it's in that period, that last interglacial, at which time, incidentally, global temperatures were one degree warmer, which is almost where they're at now, uh, and sea levels were five or six meters higher than they are now. Uh, it's during this period in Eastern Africa that modern Homo sapiens comes into being as a mutation in East Africa. Uh, comes into being and then begins to migrate its way out of East Africa, out of East Africa, goes up through Palestine, where these Homo sapiens interact with Neanderthals that have been in Palestine for a long time. The Neanderthals go way, way back. They have been in Europe as Homo heidelbergensis, uh, going clear back 400,000, 500,000 or so years ago. And they've been adapted to European uh, Ice Age climates for a long, long time. The, the so-called, what used to be called the cro which are now called modern Homo sapiens, gradually made their way up 60,000 years ago. They're in Palestine. They're apparently uh, peacefully cohabiting Palestine with Neanderthals. And then they make their way up into Europe about 40,000 years ago. Uh, when they get to Europe, um, there's a creative explosion, to use John Pfeffer's uh, famous saying, the creative explosion about 30,000 B.C., and at sites like Chauvet, we get the first cave art. Uh, and we get also at about the same time, or just slightly before that, the first goddess figurines are, are made out of mammoth ivory. And it's an interesting coincidence that right about the time this begins to happen, 30,000 B.C., Neanderthals start disappearing. So that by 27,000 B.C., they're pretty much gone. Neanderthals have been pushed out of Europe. So clearly there was uh, the first ethnic cleansing uh, took place here. Uh, there's not a lot of hard, concrete evidence for it. All the evidence is circumstantial. But I think if you read between the lines here, you can see that what happened when Cro-Magnon man, who is lighter, smarter, has a more developed frontal lobe, a, a lighter, more gracile physique, can move faster and develop very lethal technologies such that Neanderthal man did not have, such as the bow and arrow, new complex kinds of tools such as double-sided uh, tools for making other tools, and lots of bone uh, tools. Uh, that Neanderthals didn't, weren't really very fond of. Lots of bone industries, lots of new tools, new ways of building campfires, all these kinds of new technologies that uh, modern Homo sapiens invents. And what we probably have is uh, ethnic cleansing and genocide, the wiping out of the Neanderthals, the raping of the women, uh, and the absorption of the population, killing of the Neanderthal men, raping the women, and the absorption of the Neanderthal gene pool into modern Homo sapiens. We have uh, we moderns have anatomical uh, traits that Neanderthals had, such as a, a bulb on the back of our skulls <clears throat> and a certain dental nerve that the uh, modern Homo sapiens in Africa did not have. So we know that we've inherited some of these genes. So racial intermixing did take place, and we haven't been found 
uh, at Lagarvello K, for example, in Spain, we have found uh, an anatomical hybrid. Uh, a young boy was found buried there who was an anatomical hybrid. So that's what happened there. And then uh, after the great period of the creative explosion, art and culture, and so forth, and then begins to wind down uh, as the Ice Age winds down by 12,000 BC, the glaciers are melting, they're forming rivers, and we begin to get the shift of the scene of action from Europe now moves to the Middle East with the so-called Natufians, who are the peoples about 12,000 BC in Palestine who invent uh, the first sickles. We know that they had the first sickles and they have the first mortars and pestles. They're grinding grains and they're cutting grains. So it's very likely that they're already inventing agriculture here about 12,000 BC. I think it was Gordon Wasson, um, whose name I may have confused with another Gordon, found domesticated examples of rye and einkorn at the site of Abu Huraira dating back to about 11,000 BC. So agriculture is already up and running here on the upper Euphrates in Palestine where we have Abu Huraira, one of the first villages that comes into being at this time, and it's significantly located along the trade or, or along the uh, gazelle migration routes. They, they're still thinking in terms of the cast off media. They're still looking uh, at the animals uh, as the primary source where they want to set up shop nearby so they can keep an eye on them. So they still have certain transitional hunting tendencies going on here. Uh, but they set up shop at Abu Huraira, and then nearby we get Muraibet, which is not too far north of that. Muraibet, we get circular uh, architecture. We get the origins of the so-called cult of the goddess and the bull. Uh, there are bull shoulder blades and scapulae buried in the walls at Muraibet, and we get the first goddesses. The so-called Kayamians, who are the later Natufian peoples, begin to invent the first goddess figurines at this site. And so the whole cult of goddess and bull that's made famous at Chatahoyuk uh, it comes from this site. In the south, meanwhile, down uh, in Palestine, we have the famous site of Jericho, which is still one of the earliest uh, settled towns in the world. Uh, round architecture, the world's first wall with a tower on it uh, comes into being here about 9500 BC. And there's a very strong uh, ancestor worship cult here. The Jericonians uh, took human skulls and they modeled clay masks on them, and they revered them, and they had uh, the dead, they, they kept the dead with them, so there's a very strong emphasis on the cult of the ancestors, which remains constitutive all the way through the Neolithic down to the so-called Pottery Neolithic. Now, archaeologists uh, currently divide the Neolithic into three phases. The Pre-Pottery Neolithic A, which extends from about 10,000 B.C. to 8,000 B.C., uh, and then the Pre-Pottery Neolithic B, which extends from about 8,000 B.C. down to about 6,000 B.C., and then the pottery, uh, the so-called pottery Neolithic, which is, uh, extends from 6,000 to about 4,000 BC, roughly right in there. Um, in the pre-pottery Neolithic A, we have the invention of architecture, roundhouse architecture. In the pre-pottery Neolithic B, the architecture shifts and, we, and it begins to become rectilinear. We start getting uh, square-shaped villages and houses coming in. And we also get, but this is 8,000 BC, in the PPNB, we also get uh, apparently what looks like the origins of human sacrifice at, ch at sites such as uh, Chayonu, which is a site located in eastern Turkey, where at Chayonu we find buried in caches uh, beneath a temple mountains of human skulls uh, from which the flesh has been removed. And we found, uh, our archaeologists found there, uh, sacrificial blades stained with human blood and marble slabs or stone slabs stained with human blood on them. So it looks pretty clearly like uh, the later Hindu cult of Kali had its origins here, 8,000 B.C. at Chayonu uh, in eastern Turkey. Prior to this, 10,000 B.C. in eastern Turkey, uh, we had Gobekli Tepe. Gobekli Tepe is a recently unearthed archaeological site which has the earliest megalithic uh, constructions in the world. These were circles built on a hilltop out of megaliths. Uh, and Klaus Schmidt, the archaeologist who is currently digging the site, uh, expects to find buried, buried bodies underneath these megaliths. He thinks they're uh, probably most largely an ancestor cult. Uh, they have animals carved on the sides of these slabs, uh, so there's still a heavy shamanic, shamanistic carryover from the Paleolithic, but we clearly have here one of the first collective projects of doing something by plan in which there had to have been a centralized authority in order to organize all of this. That's Gebekli Tepe, 10,000 B.C., and the sequel to that site is Nivali Chori, uh, which is somewhat nearby, 8,000 BC, which the same, we have the same pillar cult, only they no longer have 
animals inscribed on them. They have human arms and eyes inscribed on them. So there's a very strong reverence for the cult of the revered dead here. The evidence is here, again, at Navali Chori. And Chayonu is nearby where we have human sacrifice fully up and running in a bloodthirsty way here. Tied in with all of this goddess worship and agriculture and, and all of this going on at this period. So uh, from 8,000 to 6,000 BC, then we get the PPN bean. And right about 6,000 BC, the cult of the revered dead, the cult of the ancestral dead, begins uh, for the first time to disappear. Uh, we see skull worship falling out. People are no longer collecting skulls and decorating the walls with them and lining them up along the walls, uh, putting lime plaster on the walls and putting skulls along the floors. They're no longer doing this. By 6000 BC, we begin to get what Mary Sedegas calls pyrotechnologies, which are the new technologies of fire that enable uh, such new inventions as uh, two-chambered kilns that enable the firing of pottery at very high temperatures. Uh, that creates a new kind of pottery that has a very elaborate designs painted on it, such as the famous Halafian ware, which dates from this period. The Halafians is a cultural group that is characterized by Tolos-style architecture, where they have most of the buildings in the site might be rectilinear, but there's at least one Tolos, or a round-shaped, uh, sometimes it's a grain storage bin, sometimes it's a burial unit uh, that's located nearby, usually with a domical top. These are Toloi, and the Halafians are spread uh, throughout eastern Turkey in the northern mountainous uplands there, and they are still practicing the worship of the revered dead. We still find skull worship there, and very strong, plump, round, fat goddess figurines are still being made there. They're very, very conservative people, the Halafians are, and their primary competitors are the Samarans in the south. Metallurgy is also coming in at this time because it, too, is a pyrotechnology, and so is the burning of the dead. Cremation of the dead first begins to originate during the Pottery Neolithic era, 6,000 to 4,000 BC, uh, coming out of all of this, all of these pyrotechnologies, so we begin to get burning of the dead. And the primary competitors, then, of the Halafians are the Samarans. Now, the Samarans have moved down onto the alluvial plain of the Middle East. They're in Mesopotamia, between the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which is a resource-poor region. There are very few precious there are no metals, hardly at all, precious stones, gems, minerals, wood. All of that is missing. It's a very rough existence. And so the Samarans, who are most likely, I think, the early pre-Samarians, uh, had a rough time. And their solution to the response of the difficulty of the terrain was to invent irrigation. So they're outside the so-called dry farming zone that the Halafians, up in the mountainous uplands with forests, can afford to remain behind in. They're getting plenty of rain up there, so they stay locked into a conservative mode. Note that Samaran pottery uh, has elaborate mandalas of animals in motion on them, whereas the Halafian pottery is very static. It's not moving. It's as con conservative as the Halafians themselves are. And so the Samarans are inventing uh, irrigation at sites like El Kelm, the El Kelm oasis about 7000 BC. We find the very first beginnings of irrigation because there are conduits. And we also find, incidentally, some of the first streets are laid out in the, the village. The buildings now, for the first time, are pulled away from each other. At Chattel Hoyuk, recall, all the buildings are stacked together into a single Pueblo-like construction. But at El Kelm and at another site nearby called Baucris, the buildings are pulled apart and there are now streets. Uh, and uh, alongside the streets, there are these little gutters running inside the houses, and there's also a spring, an oasis, at El Kelm nearby that looks pretty good. According to Jacques Cauvin, uh, the man who wrote about this, uh, one of the great French archaeologists who unearthed all this, it looks like irrigation began to originate there. Irrigation is the substitute uh, that you come up with when you don't have rain. You have to make your own rain, so you have irrigation needing to channel the Tigris and Euphrates rivers into new conduits. So we begin to get new technologies coming into being here. The plow, <clears throat> metallurgy, copper trinkets begin to appear, and the Samarans begin to give rise to uh, the next development moving south here, uh, ever further and further south with the Abidians, about 6000 BC, who are definitely the pre-Sumerian Sumerians, and they established colonies all the way down to the Persian Gulf, and they established one of the earliest uh, Sumerian cities, Eridu. Uh, Eridu was sacred to the fish god, uh, Ea, Oannes, one of the earliest of the uh, Mesopotamian deities. He was a fish god, uh, and since fish bones were found at this site, uh, it is very likely that the Abidians were already worshipping the god Ea, also known as Enki, the lord of the watery abyss. He's the Poseidon combined with Mercury figure since he's the god 
uh, not only the watery abyss, but the god with the mind who always has the solutions in Mesopotamian mythology to all the problems that the gods have later on. Uh, 